Bonjour, mesdames. Bonjour, messieurs. Welcome to Dominic Sandbrook. What is an exciting day for all fans of French politics, is it not? Because today is the day that the result of the French presidential election 2022 is announced. And we should say that we are recording this the week before, so we don't know who will have been elected. But we know that it will either be Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen. And I'm guessing, Dominic, that your money would be on the former. Uh, it probably would be, Tom, but uh, this is a terrible way to kick off because you're, if, if Marine Le Pen has won, then you're just humiliating me in the eyes of the, <laughs> in the, eyes of the listeners with my it's terrible prediction. Idea. Um, but no, we did uh, – so, Tom, we did um, – the chancellors of Germany, didn't we, uh, to tie in with Angela Merkel's retirement. So we thought it would be fun to do the, the presidents of France's Fifth Republic. So that's from 1958 onwards to tie in with – um, either the re-election of Emmanuel Macron or the um, election of Marine Le Pen, depending on what's happened. Absolutely. And um, I think we found when we did the um, the German chancellors that they were, I mean, they were they were a kind of a, a much more remarkable collection of politicians than I had kind yeah. of appreciated before. We disgraced ourselves by laughing a lot at Helmut Kohl. Do you remember? If you remember yes, yes, we did. His, about his Germanness, I, I, But also about Gerhard Schroeder. Um, yeah. And our con condemnation of, of Gerhard Schroeder as a shyster, I believe, yeah. turned out to be very professional. We've been completely so vindicated. We have been vindicated Schroeder, with that. So um, the, the French presidency, yeah, uh, as you say, so, so when we looked at the, uh, the German chancellors, of course, that's an institution that got set up in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. The French presidency, as it has existed under the Fifth Republic, uh, is, is a later creation, but it is a creation of the dominant French political figure who emerges out of the Second World War, who is, of course, Charles de Gaulle, General de Gaulle. Yeah, that's right. So for people who don't know, there have been five French republics since the French Revolution. So there was the first one in the 1790s. There was one in the 1848-52 that was basically subverted by Napoleon III, not a friend of the show. Um, there were after the fall of Napoleon III, there was a, a the third republic, 1870 to 1940. That basically was ended with the collapse in 1940 against the Nazis in World War II. Then after the Second World War, they set up a fourth republic. Um, now, de Gaulle, of course, lots of people will know. We'll, we'll come to him in just a second. We will, by the way, do a podcast just about de Gaulle, won't we, Tom? At some stage. We will, yeah. Um, but de Gaulle was the sort of face of the liberation and of... Um, defiance during the second world and War. the face of france really wasn't it yeah I mean, that he was, was his well, genius he made himself the emblem of france he did well, and we'll come to that in just a sec because i think that's really important in the way that french presidents perceive their role and the french public perceive the french presidency but de gaulle had sort of flounced out of french politics at the end of the war in 1946 partly because the fourth republic was going to have a very weak presidency and it was going to basically be a sort of parliamentary republic in which the prime minister held held all the power. The Fifth Republic comes into being in 1958, and it is associated very much with the Gaul. And, it, and it's created in the crisis surrounding the Algerian War of Independence. So France is torn apart by the Algerian crisis. Uh, it's sort of paralyzed. There's a coup, an attempted coup, basically, by the military who are fighting in Algeria. And... De Gaulle is this sort of unifying figure um, who can resolve the crisis and avert a possible civil war. And de Gaulle insists that the French, that the, the Fifth Republic will be in his image with a really strong executive presidency. The president will basically have all the power. I mean, domestic policy, the sort of nuts and bolts will be left to the prime minister, but it's the presidency who will, who will embody France. Mm. And, and I think he, de Gaulle is like Churchill in the sense that he, as a, as a, even as a boy, there's this amazing story that he, rather like Churchill, famously at Harrow, said to another boy, you know, I can see that one day I will save London and the empire from the invasion. That de Gaulle wrote a story, you've seen this when he was 15, about a character called General de Gaulle, yeah. who would lead France to victory over the Germans. Yeah. So he has this sort of demented sense of his own importance, which actually is then completely vindicated because, of course, although he doesn't lead the French army to victory over the Germans, he does become the face of resistance in the Second World War. But it's also, I mean, it's, it, it, he has a sense of his own greatness, but he also has a sense of France's greatness, doesn't he? 
And in fact, I mean, he kind of says that France cannot be France unless it is great. Yeah. Um, and our very first podcast, of course, was on the theme of greatness. And I think you could say that the thing about de Gaulle is that he he's probably the last European leader who you would call great, you know, with a, a great big capital G. Um, and I think that that certain idea of France that de, de Gaulle talked about yeah. kind of ha- it, it, it flutters like the trickler over every French president. And maybe a measure of how effective a president is leading France is, is how convincing they are standing there and taking on the, the mantle. Of I de think Gaulle. that's absolutely right. I think, so de Gaulle, they, they, a nickname for him, one of the nicknames for him, by the way, was the great asparagus. <laughs> He's <laughs> such a sort of tall, beaky man. And he, he clearly, I mean, you can even see it in sort of photos and newsreels and things. De Gaulle always had this presence and this sort of incredibly, incredible sense of himself. I always think with, with de Gaulle and with a lot of French presidents, there's only a, a very thin dividing line between them and Inspector Clouseau. Mm-hmm. So Inspector, Inspector Clouseau, in the Peter Sellers character, um, always has this tremendous sense of, dig- of his own dignity. Clouseau Even never, when he's being attacked by yeah by a dog by, or by man falling. servants hiding in fridges right exactly when he's exactly when he's when he's dressed in a knight's suit of armor and disguise or he's disguised as a Swedish sea dog or whatever or he's falling down the stairs he has this immense sense of his own importance and his own seriousness and de Gaulle has this tremendous sense of his own seriousness and of France's seriousness France is a is a unique country with this kind of exceptional history and destiny and its duty is to lead the world towards civilization and french presidents are expected to live up to that in a way that british prime ministers never are i mean a british prime minister can look kind of shabby and stand on a soapbox and have his hair all messed up and just be shambolic and all these kinds of things and that's fine because they are merely the king or queen's servant you know they're the, the king's first minister or whatever but but a french president is france Yes. You know, de Gaulle thinks well, he is the inca- reincarnation of Joan of Arc. Or, I mean, Church, apparently he said this to Churchill, and Churchill said, we've burned one Joan of Arc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, the only cross I have to bear is the cross of Lorraine, he said, didn't he? Yes, exactly. So, so he looks like a, a stick of asparagus, but yeah. I think he also looks like um, Julius Caesar in oh, right, Asterix the Gaul. Yeah. Uh, I know you haven't read, but Julius Caesar in, in, um, in, in Asterix looks very, very like de Gaulle. Um, and de Gaulle always spoke of himself in the third person, like Julius yeah. Caesar did. And there, there is that sense of the dictator, the man of destiny who arises and seizes control of his nation. And I think the other thing about de Gaulle is that um, he has something quite dictatorial about him, but he never goes the full dictator. And yeah, that's right. So there's that always that kind of slight tension about him. So it's there when he... I mean, he, you, you describe him as Clouseau, but I think that's a, a bit harsh on him because he really does kind of create an image of himself as the saviour of France, yep. almost from nothing. And more than that, he creates an image of France as a victor in the Second World War that is wholly disproportionate to the reality. But he kind of bluffs it through, doesn't he? He persuades Churchill. And, and he persuades Eisenhower that he can be first into Paris when Paris is liberated in August 1944. No, I mean, the comparison with Clouseau, I don't mean to, that, that de Gaulle is purely ridiculous. I mean that there's only the, the, the sense of – this yeah, is the genius, the sense of by dignity, the way. The yeah. sense of dignity yeah. is really, really important to Peter Sellis' characterization of Clouseau, but it's also really important to French presidents' yeah. Yeah. sense of themselves. So, de, And you say the thing about the dictator. So de Gaulle had been out of office. I mean, as I say, we'll, we'll do de Gaulle properly another time. De Gaulle is this great war hero. He has he has retired at the end of the Second World War to Colombie, Colombie de, 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 de Deux Églises, which is the, the 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 sort of now now famous worldwide as as De Gaulle's kind of well, his home. Does it have he, two churches? I assume it does. Yeah. yeah. And as you say, Tom, he has this great line. That's the first line of his war memoirs. All my life, I've had a certain idea of France, and there he is. He's the sort of um, He's this, yeah. He's a very Roman figure, actually, isn't he, Tom? This sort yeah, of great like general plow, in retirement, waiting to yeah, be summoned, absolutely to save waiting the to Republic. be summoned. Yeah. Then in 1958, Algeria, which has been presented to the French as part of France, and there are what are there? There are there are about a million people, Europeans, in Algeria. France feels it has to sort of defend them. They're the pieds noir. The army in Algeria is, is is kind of loyal to them, doesn't want to give up on Algeria, feels it's being betrayed by the Republican politicians. 
there's there's all kinds of political turmoil. The army call for de Gaulle. De Gaulle says, you know, I'm willing to serve. And actually, even then in 1958, some people say he wants to be a dictator. And de Gaulle actually makes a statement. He says, at the age of 67, I'm too old to be a dictator. Don't you think I'd be a dictator by now if but I isn't, wanted to be isn't, one? Isn't one of the people who suspect he wants to be a dictator someone who will appear later in our story, François Mitterrand? Exactly. Well, François okay. Mitterrand will make his name as an anti gaullist yeah. You know, that's one of Mitterrand's great calling cards. Jean-Paul Sartre said, um, I'm, I'm not a Jean-Paul Sartre fan by any means. Uh, he said of de Gaulle in 1958, I would rather vote for God because God is more <laughs> modest. <laughs> that's um, a good joke. But anyway, uh, de Gaulle does come in in 58. He insists that the constitution is rewritten. He has a referendum. So now the the you, you get this new institution, effectively, there have been French presidents before, but you get this strong executive presidency. Um, in some ways, stronger even than the United States presidency. Well, and longer, right? Because it's initially it's seven years. Seven year term, but also you're not as dependent on, you know, the the votes of the legislature. So, although the there will be issues with of so called cohabitation, where the the pre, the prime minister is from another party doing domestic policy, the French president basically has complete power over. Well, he's the king, isn't he? Defense. I mean, that's yeah, the other the thing. King. It's yeah. it's it's. That idea that France is kind of edictly haunted by the figure of the king that it got rid of in the well, that's the, the funny thing that France got rid of its king, but it has in some ways a more a more monarchical system, more monarchical than system yeah. certainly than Britain does. Yeah. So the very first election that De Gaulle fights as president is against Mitterrand, and we'll come to Mitterrand later. And De Gaulle wins reasonably easily, um, and then he has this sort of he has this sort of period. He's quite an old man. But he, he definitely has the sense of greatness. I mean, when you compare him with Harold Wilson, who's the British Prime Minister at <laughs> yeah. the same time in the mid-60s, de Gaulle is yeah. clearly the more, the more obviously, in inverted commas, great man. And de Gaulle goes around sort of being very French. He goes to Quebec and he says, yeah. um, vive le Québec libre, which offends the Canadians, and he has to go home straight away and cut short his, his visit because I remember the Canadians there was a, are outraged. A, a, a fabulous uh, a British cartoon of him as the force de frappe, the, um, the nuclear oh, yes, missile. The, yeah. Um, which kind of sums him up, really. He's, well, he does stuff he, like he, 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 France is still in NATO, but he refuses to have French troops under sort of NATO command and they'll withdraw from NATO's command structures. He obviously ve twice vetoes Britain's application to join the common market, which is his way of thanking well, us for our, our I mean, help he, in World War II. He, he, he has a sense, does he not, of France as not being beholden to the United States. And he yeah. sees Britain's... Uh, special relationship with the United States or slavish dependency with the United States, depending on what you prefer. De Gaulle definitely sees the, it being the latter as something to avoid. And so he, he his, his yeah. ambition is to situate France between the United States and the Soviet Union. Yeah, that's a, right. He a, thinks of France power. as a sort of third force in yeah. between the, um, which is, which is a, a bit of an illusion, really, because France is clearly part of the kind of Western alliance, a, a key part of the Western alliance. And De Gaulle is an anti-communist. Um, but it's but but the illusion is really important that in an an, an incre increasingly kind of Anglo-Saxon world, um, he needs to maintain France's kind of exceptionalism. And then in 1968, um, the the great again a brilliant subject for a podcast, Tom, the événement of yeah. May 1968 when the students the have this, yeah the students have this uprising, they're throwing cobblestones at the Parisian police, and there's a general strike. Uh, and a lot of this is, is because basically de Gaulle is now too old, too autocratic to, to the younger generation. He just seems like a he's not a hippie, is he? <laughs> he's definitely not. And de Gaulle, interestingly, and not surprisingly in some ways for a man who's lived through the world wars, he, he thinks this is a, a revolution. And he famously basically disappears uh, from Paris, vanishes, doesn't tell anyone where he's going, flies to the, um, the French military base in West Germany in Baden-Baden. And basically sort of throws himself on the mercy of General Jacques Massou, who's the commander of the French troops in West Germany, basically says, if I need to, will, will you know, if we need to, will, do I have your support to go back and crush the revolution? And, and it obviously doesn't come to that. But um, we, I think with, with 1968, you know, it's clearly the end of an era. And actually he flounces out again in April 1969. And very I think he flounces. 
Sorry? I don't think he flounces. I think flounces is exactly what he does. No, he, I think it's more like King Arthur heading off to Avalon. Oh, I think you're being very generous. He has, for, for, for listeners who don't know... He struts off. Perhaps. They have a referendum on regional government, on, on, on the system of regional councils. And everybody says it's a bad idea. De Gaulle says, well, if you won't approve my referendum on regional councils, I'm out, I'm off. And, and the public don't vote for it. And he says, right, well, I don't, don't say I didn't warn you. And off he goes a day or two later, and that's the end of him. And he dies within the year. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and uh, I think that's, that's flouncing. I mean, you may not think it's flouncing, but I think it's flouncing. <laughs> I know. I think. I think it's a, a, a dignified withdrawal. Really? I, well, it's very. That's very Inspector Clouseau. I'd say, actually, I'll tell you one other thing about uh, De Gaulle. He was asked by the writer Andre Malraux, great kind of political novelist of the twentieth century, um, who he most admired and who his great hero was. And do you know his answer, Tom? Uh, I, not Jane of Arc, because that would be too obvious, I guess. It's not Joan of Arc, it's Tintin. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, it's a good answer, I thought. Mm. No, Tintin, who was, of course, Belgian. Yes, um, very peculiar. Yeah. Very strange. So, anyway, so that's all by really by way of um, preparation, isn't it? Uh, yes. And uh, in our best style, uh, our preparation, our prologue, our forward has kind of taken up, what, 20 minutes or something. That's good. That's all, it's all, <laughs> De Gaulle is a great character, though, I think. That's, he is a great character. The other thing about De Gaulle, Tom. No, Dominic, we're going to do a whole episode on him. We can't stick to De Gaulle. I think, well, I just want to say one last thing about De Gaulle before we get to the others. So the others are all in De Gaulle's shadow and trying to be De Gaulle, or to some extent, or Mitterrand, defining themselves to against yeah. De Gaulle. But De Gaulle is also unusual because De Gaulle is, is quite a family man. So De Gaulle is famously absolutely devoted to his daughter, Anne, who had Down syndrome. And was the one person with whom he would open up. And actually, he asked to be buried next to Anne, mm. um, and he and he is. And and when you see the sort of photos and stuff, it's incredibly moving. And actually, given the behaviour of all his successors, <laughs> that definitely marks him out as an anomaly. Because well, we're going to see a succession of men whose devotion to family values is at best um, half-hearted. So that those two those two themes and De Gaulle, um, De Gaulle's uh, daughter. And outrageous marital behaviour, yeah, um, lead us very neatly into the man who succeeds to goal as president, a man called Georges Pompidou, who we will introduce après le break. See you in a sec. Now, Tom. It has been far too long since we have talked about our favourite sponsors. Well, it's one of our favourite sponsors. Anyway, I don't want to diss the other sponsors, but it's Unheard, U-N-H-E-R-D, the online magazine that, as regular listeners will know, <laughs> is always kicking back against herd, herd mentality. mentality. So, Tom, they know their audience because this week they have an, an article by one of our contributors, by one of our guests. Uh, so regular listeners will remember we did a podcast about um, African decolonization with Tommy Oalade. Uh, and he wrote an article for Unheard Tom, which I would like to hear your thoughts about. It was called The Future of Anglicanism is African. And he said, basically, black Africa, you know, London is a very religious place. It's the most religious city in Britain because it's black Africans are driving this kind of church membership. And Tom Oladi says conservatives who want to renew Christianity in Britain should stop listening to Justin Welby and the Pope. They should lobby for an open borders immigration policy for all the African countries that Britain wants colonized. Do you, Tom, agree with this? That's my well, question. Well, I, I read the article with great interest, partly because I always enjoy reading Tom, who is always a fabulous writer, writes beautifully, very, very interestingly. Um, and yeah. I thought this was a great topic on something that I've kind of been pondering as well. I mean, the detail that Tom includes in his essay that um, the place in the country that is most hostile to gay rights is London seems yeah. very, very counterintuitive because you imagine, you know, what do you think is, it would be? What are you going to, which part of the country are you about to diss? Well, I knew that it was London. Oh, did you? Uh, and, and I guess kind of living in Brixton, I'm kind of very aware of that, that you, um, you know, you can, can see people pouring out of say gay clubs at uh, eight o'clock on a, a Sunday morning. And you can also see um, people in their Sunday best heading off to, to church. Um, right. And it's kind of very, that's very much a kind of Brixton scene. So I thought it, I thought it was really, really interesting, really stimulating. And I, I think he, he ends on a note of um, saying, you know, nothing could be more Christian than um, the recolonization of the imperial capital by people um, 
coming from countries that have been converted by... It's like he wrote it just for you. (laughs) I know, I know. So anyway, it's a wonderful essay. Check it out. Check out everything else he has uh, written. Uh, And of course, check out Unheard, U-N-H-E-R-D. Do you have a special offer to offer? Yeah, because here is the thing. As as so often is the way with Unheard, there is a special offer for Rest is History listeners. Now, it is normally one pound a week. Some listeners may know these words off by heart by now. It is normally one pound a week, but our listeners will get their first 10 weeks free. I mean, they are literally giving it away. And for that, you will get four long pieces today, hard-hitting, penetrative, insightful essays. You will get a podcast. A podcast? I didn't, didn't read that. But they, you get a pod, another podcast. You should obviously listen to our yeah, podcast. I'm sure that's quite good as well. Uh, you get YouTube interviews. We don't do those, so you're free to watch the YouTube interviews without feeling any trace of guilt. And that will all be showcasing new and independent thinking. And as you surely all know by now, you get that by going to unheard.com slash rest. That's U-N-H-E-R-D dot com slash rest. Bienvenue. Welcome back to The Rest is History. So, Georges Pompidou, who will be most famous as uh, the man who gives his name to the... <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? He's most Pompidou famous as a, as a centre. <laughs> Well, he's most yes, he's most famous for having his inside his uh, his intestines on the outside. <laughs> yes, I guess so, so. The great the great kind of museum of modern art, and that of course is also a huge theme running through the French presidency. Is um, they're very very fond of their grand projet, their kind yeah. of cultural achievements, in a way that that British prime ministers are, are simply not. But um, I mentioned the the link with Anne de Gaulle. So Georges Pompidou, uh, he is kind of from the Auvergne, I think, isn't he? He is from the Auvergne, yeah. Parents are farmers and things. Uh, yeah, very rural area. And he, like a subsequent um, French president, ends up working for uh, the Rothschild Bank. Yes, yes. I, I had I hadn't thought of the link, but obviously he and Macron have then. Yeah. Um, but he's then recruited from the Rothschild Bank by de Gaulle to go and work for the Anne de Gaulle Foundation. That's right. He did. He had worked for he had worked for de Gaulle before. Tom, he had been a sort of uh, apparatchik for him, factotum. But you're right, he did work for the Anne de Gaulle Foundation. Uh, how would we describe it? I mean, he has huge Dennis Healy-style eyebrows. He is a cross between – I was thinking about this while I was researching it, obviously the, about the key historiographical questions. And it struck me that the best way to describe Georges Pompidou for people who haven't seen him, um, and, and this will mean nothing <laughs> whatsoever to overseas listeners, he is literally a cross between Dennis Healy and Ray Reardon. Yeah, good, good, good shout. Okay, well, I think what you should do for, for overseas listeners who may not be familiar with with either of them is to put up a tweet yeah. or he, something or on the he Discord looks like showing a, what they look like. He looks like a man who might have managed Huddersfield Town in 1927. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so so he he he's not a man who exudes a sense of greatness. I think it would be fair to say. No, but he was actually a pretty good president. Yeah, so he well, succeeds. absolutely. Okay, but but Dominic, before yeah. we get on to that, before we yeah. get on to the succession, his election, yeah. his election exists in the shadow of a sex scandal. Are you are you familiar? I'm not with familiar the, with this. And, and with I'm the Markovic scandal. No, because you're very excited about it. And so I'm greatly looking forward to hearing <laughs> okay. about it. Okay, so Stefan Markovic. Yeah. Uh, he was the bodyguard of uh, Alain Delon, famous French actor. Very good actor, yeah. At the time, was starting out on his career and used to hold sex parties. Alain Delon or the driver? Uh, Delon. And Markovic would film them. And supposedly, Pompidou's wife was at one of these sex parties. (laughs) And there were all kinds of rumours of blackmail and um, extortion and all this kind of stuff going on. And Pompidou thought that this had been leaked by de Gaulle. And so that contributed to his his bust up with de Gaulle. Also, the fact that de Gaulle hadn't told him that he was scarpering off to Germany during uh, yeah. during the, the events of uh, 1968. Um, and Pompidou said that it wasn't his wife, but a prostitute who looked exactly like his wife. But de Gaulle's what? I mean, Pompidou's wife must have been in her fifth, what, in her, <laughs> well, in her 60s. Well, was de Gaulle yeah. hiring <laughs> sex yeah. prostitutes? That seems very implausible. Because Alain Delon was a very good looking young man. They order things differently in France. They clearly do. This is the kind of stuff that goes on. Alain Delon had a had a ma- Macronian attitude to these attitudes. Clearly, anyway. So, so Markovic, Markovic, Markovic got found dead, and um, there, it was a kind of snarl of who'd killed him, uh, who who this woman was. Was it the prostitute? Was it Pompidou's wife? Anyway, so this is the first of many such scandals. Yeah, that have uh, 
that w- that will be enlivening this narrative, I think. But just, so I just wanted to put that on the record that that is that is kind of the backdrop to uh, Pompidou coming to power. And it, you're right that he's a very very effective president. I mean, very effective, much more effective than than say contemporary British prime ministers, wouldn't you say? I mean, he's uh, well, he's he yeah, because he, he coincides with Ted Heath. Yeah, but he's, but. Um... Pompidou is the sort of father of the, the TGV, the, the French high speed trains. And the nuclear program, I think. Yeah. So all and he's these keen kind on of great. Concord and France is in a, in a better condition than Britain, I think, in the late 60s, early 70s. France has overtaken Britain in its GDP. It is a bit more um, self confident, I think. Um, a bit less. I mean, it, of course, France is divided in various ways, but it's 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 more comfortable with its divisions, I think, than than seventies Britain. And it had had what the the trente glories. It has the indeed thirty years of kind of economic recovery. I'll tell you a couple of other things um, about Georges Pompidou. So Georges Pompidou mm. is the French president who everybody kind of forgets, apart from his centre. He is the sort of people are tired of De Gaulle, so. They don't mind having Pompidou, who's a bit more of a pragmatist. And well, he's John Major too. He is John Major. That's Thatcher. exactly what he is. And, and yeah. so he it's obviously he is the one president who's not expected to play de Gaulle because he's the, you know, he's the, yeah. he's the he's the morning after, if you like. The two things I was going to say about Pompidou is Pompidou in very French style is also the author of an anthology of French poetry. Well, he studied literature. Yeah, he was a literature professor, which is still used, I think, in some French schools, the Pompidou Anthology. Um, which is again, you don't see that from Ted Heath. But presidents, presidents in France are meant to be cultured, right? They are. Pompidou had an excellent thing to say about history in his place in history. Did you see this, Tom? No. He said, uh, "Happy people are not noted in history. I therefore hope historians do not have much to say about my term in office." And we don't. <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> not really. I mean, it obviously ended. Uh, the other interesting thing about Pompidou is the way it ended. So he's a pragmatist. He's a technocrat. He's sort of centre right. Um, his, his presidency is, I, th- I think, in retrospect, reasonably successful, but it, it it ends very abruptly in April 1974 when he dies in office. Yeah, and actually, of, of he cancer, right? I think. Of, of, a, of a very rare blood cancer. And actually, the truth of the matter is, Pompidou had known he was ill, but it, and this is another theme of the French presidency, very secretively, he had managed to keep it not just from the public, but also a lot of his own colleagues. He dies, and this he dies four days before the Eurovision Song Contest is due to be held in Brighton in 1974. Yeah. Um, so the French withdraw from the Eurovision Song Contest. That's a mark of respect of for George Pompidou. And it was just as well that they did, because do you know the song that won the Eurovision Song Contest in 1974? Had, had Pompidou just met his Waterloo, Tom? <laughs> Bowie. <Were we? laughs> oh, so the irony, golly! Thank goodness the they didn't go. Yeah, the irony. So um, a- a- Abba won, and obviously did not dedicate it to no. George Pompidou. Well, that would have been, been, yeah, that would yeah, have been, would have been insensitive. So the departure of Pompidou paves the way for perhaps the most, in some ways, the most entertaining of French presidents. I think, um, and some ways also my least favourite. Well, I would say definitely the the French president who looks most like he would have been guillotined, but also the one who looks most like. A French president provided by a casting <laughs> agency. Yeah, well, right. I mean, they're pretty much the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So e- even his name sounds <laughs> like he belongs on a tumbrel. Valérie, Valérie Gis- Giscard d'Estaing. So Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, the world's haughtiest man. Um, <laughs> the, his grandfather apparently had added d'Estaing to the family name to make them seem aristocratic. But, but the d'Estaing they were-, were very... Distinguished medieval family, and and shamelessly later in life, did you see this? Valerie Giscard d'Estaing bought the d'Estaing Castle <laughs> yes, with his brother. Yeah, so the the d'Estaing. I mean, they they went right the way back to. I think one of them saved Philip Augustus at the Battle of Bavine, and they got up to all kinds of stuff, went on crusades and things. Wow! The very last of the d'Estaing was an admiral who I think had served in the American Revolution on the French side, American side, uh, but then ended up guillotined. And so this is the guy that... But the, trying to... I mean, the 70s... he's got his dang, he's kind of modelling himself on. Yeah, it's run, being a 70s politician and trying to model yourself on guillotine aristocrats <laughs> is absolutely ludicrous behaviour, but absolutely <laughs> true to Gisdang, to Giscard d'Estaing's character. So he's born in 1926, isn't he? He was in the resistance. He was in the army. Like so many of the people who are going to talk about, he, he goes to the two institutions. I mean, people talk about British politics as kind of class-ridden and introverted and... Like, narrow cabal and all this but everybody in this story goes to two, one of two places they go to either a place called Sciences Po which is where you do political science or they go to the École Nationale d'Administration ENA ENA and that's where 
Shiskar went, and he is a pure He's technocrat. An arc. He is an arc. He is a he is a Mandarin. But Dominic, also just before we get onto that, you also yeah. said that you know he he served in the resistance, and yeah. actually the role that people play in the Second World War, and I suppose also in the Algerian crisis. I mean, this that's also very very important, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to have had a good war. You've got to have had a good war, and I think all um, these people, obviously, De Gaulle. Um, Giscard being in the resistance later on. Mitterrand's Mitterrand past will come. Interesting one. We'll yeah, save it's that. Slightly but, more conflicted, but yeah. um, you're right. Yeah, Giscard comes in. He's 48 years old. Um, he's definitely a new generation. Uh, he's a modernizer. And um, his modernizing, I think, is less successful than Pompidou's because the one thing that Giscard is really famous for is, is embracing a thing called Minitel. Have you ever used Minitel? <laughs> no, I haven't. But that's the French um, internet. That's, avant la lettre, right? Yeah, that's the French version of the internet. So yeah. for people. C-fax. Yeah, it's basic. Well, we had a thing called Prestel. Did you have? Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> but we didn't really push it. Whereas the French absolutely went all in. So when I lived in France in the nineteen nineties, they were still the internet had come along, but they were still desperately yeah. f- sort of flogging their kind of Betamax version of the internet, the Minitel thing, um, which was sort of so the Minitel was like you got a little terminal, and um, if you ever if you lived in the eighties and you ever read sort of predictions of what the future would be like and what people would use computers for. That was what Minitel was. Mm. You know, you could do your horoscope. You could order some groceries that would arrive in a month. Order um, a jetpack. Yeah, you could You could book very complicated train tickets at Well, on the TJV, cost. which, uh, of course, he's he's also pushing. So yes, that's right. That, that, that's more successful. And actually, he does. I'm being mean to him because he does do other things. He better pensions and divorce reform, and illegal, he legalizes abortion, and he does sort of other sort of 60s, 70s kind of Well, modernizing. he brings in Simo Vale, right, as, as right, health he has minister female, who brings it in. female cabinet ministers. And actually, I'll tell you who the parallel for Giscard de Stang is. He's actually Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter came to power at a similar time in America and was very much sort of, I'm going to be a populist. I'm going to be in touch with the people. And, and Giscard tries that at first. Well, he goes on the metro, doesn't he? And- he goes on the metro. He has dinners with the public. <laughs> and at one point, he has some dustmen for Christmas to the Elysee Palace. <laughs> he, and, and the polls show that the pub, French public hate this because they expect the president to be kind of the sun king. So he then just spends the rest of his life at the other. This was just a, a feeble gesture that he didn't mean at all. And so he spends the rest of his life trying to make up for this. And actually, when you go through the Giscard d'Estaing stories, they are absolutely – he does things like he goes hunt, he goes hunting in Poland and gets the French <laughs> Air Force to supply him with hunting – to fly <laughs> hunting rifles. He – at state dinners, when he's not dining with another head of state, he has the seat opposite him removed so he doesn't have to look anyone in the eye. Uh, when Mrs. Thatcher – entered the scene in Britain in 1979. He wouldn't have her put next to him at dinner because she was only a, she was a mere head of government and he was mm. a head of state. And she got her own back by... Seating him opposite portraits of Nelson and Wellington, <laughs> uh, which I think is absolutely splendid behaviour. <laughs> um, so he behaves in this incredibly ludicrously kind of haughty way. And that, I think, comes back to bite him at the end of the, the 70s. Well, also what comes back to bite him is um, his relationship with a friend of the show, uh, Bacassa. Emperor Picasso. Emperor Picasso, <laughs> of this, who we okay. talked about in the 12 Days of Christmas. We who do. gives him a load of diamonds, doesn't he? That's right. And uh, so Picasso is this um, sort of parodic African dictator of the 1970s, for people who don't know, who runs the Central African Republic and crowns himself emperor at this incredibly lavish ceremony modelled on Napoleon's coronation. And he spends kind of 90% of the <laughs> entire country's GDP on, yeah, on, his own coronation. on his coronation. But he also finds time to give Giscard these diamonds because French presidents at this point, as part of their sort of self-image as a counterweight to the United States, they're spending a lot of time trying to build up influence in kind of post-colonial Africa. And um, Giscard takes these diamonds from Bacassa. This is then exposed by the French satirical magazine, Le Canard Enchaîné. And um, Giscard goes ballistic, says it's absolutely disgrace that uh, people are accusing him of taking these diamonds, although he clearly has taken them. But there's also he's also a bad man, Tom, I think, in the, on the marital front. Um, so supposedly... I mean, there's all kinds of, there's, it's, well, it's very unclear whether he did or did not have a relationship with Sylvie Christel, the star of the Emmanuel um, mm-hmm. soft porn films of the 70s. Yeah. What is definitely true is that he used to meet people for assignations at a, at a, at a very aptly named <laughs> um, hostelry called Le Petit Coco Chon, which is the, the, the little cock in the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he would leave. He always had a. No, he always would leave sealed notes with his aides 
um, to well, say, this is where you can find me if there's a nuclear war or some sort of emergency. Because <laughs> he was always somewhere different. He carried it into his old age, didn't he? Because he, he famously, <laughs> notoriously, yeah. uh, wrote a kind of semi-pornographic novel about him and, and Princess <laughs> Diana, who, <laughs> who, who appears as Patricia, Princess of Cardiff. And it's yeah, all about right. the French president. and Yeah, he's called Princess Jacques, of Cardiff. He's called Jacques-Henri <laughs> Lambetti. <laughs> <laughs> Who could he be writing about? But you know where he def- where he seduces the Princess of Cardiff? Remind me. Um, on a train coming back from a ceremony to to memorialise the D Day landing. <laughs> oh, oh! I mean, oh, his, cordial. His direct contemporary, James Callaghan, Tom, would never have written an erotic novel. No, no, nor kind. nor had uh, James Callaghan lived to the age of ninety three. Would he have been accused of um, groping a German journalist? That's right. About two years ago. Uh, it was, was it? it was two years before he before he died at the age of ninety five in twenty twenty. Wow! So I mean, I mean that is. I mean the thing about Shiska, I think, is Shiska has absolutely no sense of himself as a comic character at all. I don't know how many French listeners or francophone listeners we have, but maybe they can enlighten us as to whether people in France see Shiska as an essentially comic figure, or whether they share his sense of his own tremendous importance. Well, he's a loser, isn't he? Because he ends up losing. Uh, at, on the back of the uh, the Bacasa Diamond scandal, yeah, to um, for the first time a left wing president. That's right, it's François Mitterrand. And, we'll come, and just one other thing on Giscard. Giscard, um, when you sort of study French presidential politics, there are only sort of it's like one of those soap operas where there are only really ten characters because um, mm. they just spend all their time feuding with each other. And one of the great feuds in French politics is between Giscard and a subsequent yeah. right wing president Jacques Chirac. And because Chirac runs against Giscard in 1981 yeah. and then doesn't really properly endorse him. That feud probably opens the door for François Mitterrand. So that is all for today's pod. But on tomorrow's episode, we will be covering Mitterrand and Chirac and Sarkozy and, of course, the excellently named uh, François Hollande and Emmanuel Macron and the shadowy figures of the Le Pens. However, if you simply can't wait until tomorrow, sign up to The Rest is History Club, where you'll have the next episode straight away. Just go to therestishistorypod.com, restishistorypod.com, and we will see you then. Abianto.